Cheyenne asked me to tie things together, which I thought was a pretty tall order, but in the uh, instrument, in the uh, interest of parsimony and getting to the cocktail hour, I thought I could sum up things with uh, two or three words. Uh, problems, disruption, and integration. Uh, and all of these issues, by the way, it struck me, this goes so far beyond uh, the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act. These are really meta issues. And the uh, Affordable Care Act is really an epiphenomenon in the midst of this storm, as Susan was referring to. Uh, I think everyone spoke about self-evident or very evident problems. We may disagree about the origin or the details and so on. Uh, but almost everyone agreed the system was unsustainable, either from a quality, cost, access point of view. And we're not over that bump yet. I think the other thing that if you listen to what everyone was saying, we are not going to solve these problems without disruption. And you may debate whether, you know, disruptive innovation and there's all that, but the world is changing and it's gonna change dramatically. And that may involve realigning uh, incentives. Uh, it's quite clear, irrespective of what party you belong to or what you think the solution is, there's gonna be realignment of incentives. There's gonna be movements of payments there's gonna be winners or losers. Uh, there, as Tom was talking about, we are seeing in every state, every in system we look into, there's changing in the way the uh, care is delivered and organized. And I don't know whether Tom prefers the old, uh, the old situation where you knocked on the door and you talked, or the EHRs now, but it is changing. I was just at a, a Yale, alum, Yale Medical uh, School alumni meeting, and. People are actually yelling at me because I was describing trends. I said, look, I, this isn't my policy. I'm just describing to you what has happened. The organization uh, of care is uh, changing. And integration, I, I think, uh, although we all liked the entrepreneur, or many of us thought it was very nice to have an individual practitioner who knew you and there were conversations, the trend, a trend that is uh, uncontrovertible, I think, is that there's going to be more integration, whether that's integration of incentives, as we talked about bundling, whether it's integration of practice groups, whether it's uh, integration of integration of uh, information, we're going to move towards uh, integration. Uh, in this session, Ruth started talking about, in her own way, uh, disruption in the way we use capital. People are thinking about investments in very, very different ways in philanthropies than they used to. There's a, there must be an article a week on philanthropy, how people are thinking about it. By the way, I, by the way, it was, uh, I believe it was intestinal worms. I believe it was a randomized trial in Kenya, and the main effect was uh, absenteeism. Absenteeism dropped about 25%, and then other students were less likely to get it. And we don't know about the follow-up. That was done with secondary data and so on, but it's often used as a, uh, as Ruth is an example of how we should be approaching these uh, uh, ideas. Uh, Tom talked about the tsunami. tsunami. Uh, I told you about when I got to Connecticut, it was basically all individual or small group practice. Now 50% or more of the physicians nine years later are in these uh, affiliated groups. Huge uh, difference in changes. Um, we had several talks, and Laura talked about uh, I thought it was fascinating in Alabama, talk about disruption. Uh, I have all these meetings in uh, Connecticut and they start, people are starting to talk about population health and they say, yeah, we, we should uh, think about that. Uh, but again, I was at a meeting at the Yale uh, Health, uh, New Haven Health System the other day and there was uh, half a dozen people, you know, CEOs and heads of clinics and so on. And I said, I bet you not a person in this room thinks we're correctly delivering care the way we could do it if we had free reign. Let's take diabetes care. And everyone said, oh yeah, I would do this, this, and that. Problem is there's gonna be winners or losers. The CEO of the hospital has an obligation to the hospital. The, head, the medical director of the Yale Medical Group was there. So we have to think about again uh, this integration and going beyond that. And uh, Tom, I think you encapsulated nicely a lot of the tsunami. Susan would have liked this, uh, the metaphor. I don't know if you were here before, but this is a flight flying through storms and so So those comments, let me stop. Uh, I saw that just sort of as an overview, and although these seemed like very disparate presentations, there were a lot of themes that cut across them. So let me open it up to questions to any of the panelists. Or if you have a solution to the uh, healthcare system. Can I, Ruth. I, I'd like to ask Ann Laura a question. Um, given some examples that I gave in global 
um, development, poverty alleviation, if you could identify a philanthropic opportunity in Alabama, what would it be? I mean, where's the non-governmental lever that can be pulled that's hopefully sustainable and not just um, dropping in and dropping out? You know, I have to say, in terms of a specific, very specific intervention, um, that would be something I'd be interesting, uh, interested in exploring, but the general category of education is by far the most important thing that Any we need to do. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, you know, <laughs> possibly. Um, but uh, interestingly enough, you know, uh, our, our state budget uh, has been a disaster uh, for many years, uh, but this year we had three special sessions in order to pass a budget, and um, a decision had to be made uh, whether to cut Medicaid, which I already said was incredibly underfunded, by 30%, or take money away from schools. And what happened? They took money away from schools. So, you know, that's the reality of the situation, and it's got to change. So, um, I certainly think there's room for philanthropy in that area in Alabama, no doubt. By the way, one of the analysis, and uh, I don't know if Meredith is still here, of the Massachusetts, uh, Massachusetts has among the highest health care costs in the country, and the education budgets, many people attribute the lower education budgets to that, and that they've suffered. This is, in some senses, a zero-sum game. Yes? Well, we need to address the
Um, that's, a, that's a long question, but, but let me give you the, uh, the short answer is no. Uh, and the reason are, uh, you know, everyone asks all of us all the time, we all travel internationally, say, well, what country's best? And I can say, well, you know, Denmark has these features and Switzerland has these features and I can talk about Canada and so on. Uh, but the fact of the matter is that you, the United States has a very unique history and the types of people who came here, the political circumstances under which they came here, the politics, the diversity, and so on. Uh, Betsy Bradley, uh, one of our colleagues, has noted that the United States is quite unique in the balance between social services and healthcare services and expenditures. And she's doing an analysis internationally of, of why that is and how that comes about. And without going into that, um, I think we're just a very different country. I, I mentioned I don't like the apples and oranges question because I think if we we're really smart, we could treat apples the same way we treat oranges. Uh, but the reality is we are different people with different political histories and different political sensibilities. And I think that's going to result in different solutions uh, to these kinds of problems. I don't know what uh, other, and there's a lot of diversity among states, but I'll turn it over to other people about their opinions. I wish I may have to admit that I read that many books about electrical properties of democracy in America. Uh, it's a real mistake. Even today, in fact, even more today than it was when it was in 1912 or 1913. Uh, and I recommend the second volume, which talks about the story of the comparing France to the United States. Uh, and, uh, and he says something that, that was kind of mentioned today. Experimentation aspect of the US, which is the most fascinating and diagnostic country for all the nations. And he says, you know, unlike France, which is legislated by coalition states and the so well bred and low political as well, the United States, they treat it any law at all. But you know what? When it doesn't work, they treat it immediately. So <laughs> this is wonderful because we can play with different things. We are right now we're going through change. Healthcare environment, it looks really good. Okay, we really try to make healthcare a decision, we try to do that. But the beauty of this country is uh, the ability to compromise. By the way, the word compromise, I know in France was banned for any other form of medicine, I know, I don't know how it works. No one understands what Americans mean by compromise. The, the, the Italian deal is unconscionable. We but it's connotation is wrong. We've forgotten too. <laughs> Could you speak to John Boehner about that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let me, let me add to that. Uh, the presumption that the OECD, OECD countries should be grouped to a common norm is itself a little bit of a red herring, right? Denmark, Germany, Switzerland are all multi-insured systems that look a lot more like the U.S. than they do like France or Sweden or the U.K. or Canada. And you can imagine the U.S. converging along a path towards a more structured multi-payer system with global budgets in the way I was described earlier today. That's a possible future. The notion of converging towards a single-payer system run by governments is almost anathema to the anti-authoritarian tradition of the U.S. So that seems very unlikely. But I think. In either direction, I think Richard put his finger on a, on a very important point, which is Americans' propensity for experimentation. It is both our saving grace and our potential path to change. Because we have a very hard time sticking to anything long enough to see if it actually works. And that's something we really have to think about. Any other? By the way, de Tocqueville came to study the uh, penal system, and he ended up writing one of the great works about uh, the United States and health care. Other questions? Yes, ma'am. The gentleman behind you. Well, 
I'll turn over to the panel. Re let me reframe that. Uh, if people couldn't hear, we haven't heard about nurses or I don't like the word, you know, extender, different professions working together. I think it's uh, inescapable to provide uh, adequate health care. We're going to have to expand the number of clinical providers and providers are going to have to change the ways in which they work. Uh, I've done a couple national studies of teams and we never get results because people really don't work in teams right now. You may think you have a Wednesday morning team that meets, but you're not really working uh, in the way high-performing institutions or organizations work. So I, I don't know what my panelists think, but I think A, we're going to see uh, you know, changes in, we already had changes in Connecticut on restraint of you know, practice laws throughout the country. The Robert Johnson Foundation has worked on that. And we're going to see dramatic changes on interprofessional collaboration and cooperation. That's my opinion. I don't know what. I think that it's an essential part of systems engineering and um, in a fully integrated organization like Kaiser Permanente, it's been extremely successful and a really, really important part of um, continued care. So um, I think that in many ways, there are sort of lots of successful models of really, really Complete teams, so I think that's a really important point. And I couldn't agree more. Um, you know, every day I work with three nurse practitioners, a variety of nurses, a dietitian, a diabetes educator, uh, several PharmDs, uh, several pharmacy students. So you know, I have a, a large team that is interacting in a lot of different areas, and I think it's absolutely essential, particularly in the areas with fewer resources. And you know, we're faced with a situation where, for a lot of those um, uh, special specialties, um, we don't get reimbursed for any of the work that they do. So we have to provide, you know, some return on investment for our healthcare organization, which is often difficult to show. And I would say, in private practice, and at least throughout our area, increasingly, nurse practitioners and other providers of care besides physicians are. Um, are filling the gap because I think increasingly we're seeing less uh, young physicians going into outpatient primary care and frankly it's I think uh, imperative that teams and the ability to work in teams will allow for high quality care. Uh, Amanda left but uh, I was going to tell her we, we actually did uh, many years ago an experiment in New York where patients with referrals, we, we uh, referred to a primary care practitioner, nurse practitioner, or a primary care physician, and the care was comparable or better. I also did a national study of HIV care, and the uh, several thousand people throughout the country, and those who said a nurse practitioner or a physician's assistant um, were their primary provider actually did better. And, and we don't think it's because they were better than the physicians but they were working in configurations in which there was more rational allocation of skills. Physicians were actually allowed to use their times for differential diagnosis and competent treatment. Nurse practitioners could do things that they were best trained to do. So I think most of us, if we went into back to our own organization, said could we rationalize uh, the roles and tasks better than they currently are, with the exception of Kaiser, uh, maybe group health, and a couple organizations, we could probably come up with a better model. Yes, sir. Yeah, I think the question I think many of us want to know about some of the areas. The issue of ever growing costs is a bit of a subject that generally is spoken of in our discussion. But I think the scope for a, a discounted cash based system uh, arising where the primary care doctor says, okay, I'll do this procedure for forty percent less. Yes, I, I, I do, absolutely. I think, I think uh, patients are actually looking for care in, <clears throat> in different ways. And frankly, uh, my internal medicine practice, I, I practice in a traditional private practice for 15 years. And then in the last several, moved into a practice where we actually do have a, a membership fee associated with our, our being a part of the clinic. What that affords patients is more time with the physician, more accessibility to the physician. 
and the fees are reasonable. Now, I think uh, here in, in, the, in, in Oregon we have uh, various entities that are, are testing these waters and basically charging patients fees, uh, not going through insurance and basically saying we'll take, we'll take 40 or $50 or $100 for a visit to make it to, to, which gives the patient a much more convenient and easy to access system. So I think a lot of patients who don't want to sit around in a doctor's office or wait weeks to get an appointment are looking for these different types of opportunities. I, so I think physicians and groups of physicians are looking at ways to do this. Whether that will take hold completely or not remains to be seen. It's already happened. Uh, there's been articles about, quote unquote, the firm, talking about the hospital for oh, 10 or 15 years. And the, I mean, everyone here is younger than I am, but the hospital that I grew up with is not today's hospital. It's a very, very different place with very, very different places and very different technologies and very, very different personnel. So you've already seen that transfer of a lot of hospital care. Uh, to outpatient care. I mean, you mentioned pharmacists. I had an article with some pharmacists last year about how they're going to play a role in the patient-centered medical home. Going back to Meredith's talks, as we bundle payments, as we disrupt these systems and get more integration, people are going to look to who can best provide care at the best cost, most efficiently. And it's, it's going to take a while. It's going to take experimentation, but it's it. The way we provide primary care uh, within five years is going to be transformed as much, I think, as hospital care has been tra transformed over the last two decades. So, yes, sir. Final question, I think. <laughs> KP expert here. You want to? Well, I, the, um, Dr. Hayward is more of a KP expert in that realm than me, but um, I think that it's a question of um, payers and, and how um, reimbursement rather than population care programs. I'm going to deflect back to a public health perspective. 
Tremendous amount of food for thought and grist for discussion over cocktails. Before I invite you upstairs, however, I have a series of thanks, and I'll try and be concise. Uh, Allison, Susan, and Cheyenne this morning thanked a wide range of people, and I won't repeat all those names. It really does take a village to do a 
a meeting like this. And I would like to repeat all those, all the people in the Alumni Association from both Yale and around here and everyone involved that were mentioned in the planning of this. Uh, I have sort of a rule, I never single anyone out because it's, uh, it's never quite just because it, it, some people interpret it as denigrating the contributions of many people. And I, I know how many people contributed to this. Uh, we go to talks uh, all over the world, really, a lot. And I, I can't remember when I've been to a meeting that's as well organized, as graciously and generously uh, organized and facilitated, and everything has gone smoothly. And I know that does not uh, happen easily. Uh, I'm going to break my rule. Um, I'm going to single out Cheyenne. Uh, I, I've talked to. Diane sent us a lot of emails. He said, you know, I've never done this before. I'm not sure if I'm doing it the right way, and I don't know how you do this. Cheyenne, let me tell you, uh, it cannot be done better. It has never been done better. I've never been treated as graciously and generously as you have. And I know from talking to numerous people, many of you were talked to personally by Cheyenne to make sure you got here and contributed, so thank you. And uh, several people have said, you know, there's a you know, rock bands will get up and say, well, we wouldn't be here if it weren't for you. Well, we wouldn't be here if it weren't for you. So we want to thank you both for uh, sharing your time and your ideas. Uh, and I know from talking to all the presenters that this has been as, as engaged, as interesting, and as fun a group to talk to today as we've ever worked with. So thank you, everyone, for making this such a great day. And cocktails are upstairs. <laughs>